Hi, I'm Roxanne Reddington Wild. I'm on the board of the Partnership of Historic Bostons, and I want to welcome everyone to the second of our annual fall series. This year, the fall series is the power of place, indigenous views of land, place, and belonging in early New England and very much today also. And as you are well aware, our speaker is Dr. Frank Wabu O'Brien. He's talking on whose name, whose place, native place names in southern New England. So let me introduce Frank and briefly also introduce our respondent. Um, actually, even before I introduce Frank and our respondent, let me just tell you how we are structuring today. Frank will be talking on whose name, whose place, uh, for about 45 minutes or so. And then our respondent, Rashad Young, will come on and respond with his own views and thoughts and ideas. And then we will go, at that point, we'll have about 20 minutes left or so, and we'll go to you and your questions, your questions that you'll be putting throughout in chat if you want, your questions that once we get to the, okay, it's now time for questions, you're welcome to ask live. We can call upon you and you can unmute and ask it live. And then, of course, at about 25 past 12 or so, we will then switch back to myself and Gina will put on the slide for the next event in The Power of Place. So let me introduce a person who I am delighted to have gotten to know over the past, I guess, couple months or so, and that's Dr. Frank Wabu O'Brien. Frank is a member of the um, Abenaki Nation, Abenaki Nation. He is also a doctor. He did his dissertation in linguistics at Columbia. He is the past president of the Aquidneck Indian Council in Rhode Island. And the way that I found him as I was basically scouring the internet and academia looking for, there must be someone who is a specialist on the native place names and who especially my very much hope was is also native and can approach native place names from the vital native indigenous perspective and not from the uh, external perspective. For instance, that I, as uh, basically a white descendant of Puritan colonists, colonizers, would approach it from. And I stumbled across references to a book, Understanding Indian Place Names in Southern New England. I was like, that's what I want. Who did this? Who did this? And it turned out to be by Dr. Frank Wabu O'Brien. Uh, and it turned out that he had also written Native Peoples of Southern New England with another uh, Native uh, author, Strong Woman. So I started looking around and couldn't find hide nor hair of Frank, actually, until I reached out to uh, Loren Spears, who some of you may remember. She is the director of the Tomaquag Museum. She spoke last spring um, for uh, the partnership, and actually just this past weekend, m a number of us went down to the Tomaquag Museum in Rhode Island. I connected with her, and she said, oh, Frank, oh yeah, he was over here at the Tomaquag Museum a few weeks ago. Here's his email. And I emailed and said hi. Um, this is Roxanne from the partnership. Would you be interested in uh, presenting on your research and your understanding and your perspective on native pa place names past and present? And uh, actually, I think the next morning I got an email back from Frank saying yes, and I've already started the PowerPoint. Um, so I'm really excited about this. Frank, as I said, uh, is specializes in this. His background also, he's a retired mathematician um, with the Department of Defense. He was also di diversity a diversity manager with the Department of Defense. Um, he brings a wide variety of perspectives to our program. In addition to Frank, uh, Frank, as he consistently has pointed out to me, the Abenaki Nation is from northern New England. He very much wants, and I, the partnership entirely agrees, to have 
native perspective from southern New England also, uh, indigenous to southern New England. So I am pleased to say that we will have a respondent, Rashad Young, who is an enrolled member in the uh, Mashantucket Pequot Tribal Nation on works for the Mashantucket uh, Co Cultural Resources Department and teaches uh, Mashantucket Pequot, the Pequot language, and he will be responding, and I'll introduce him basically after Frank in more detail. With that, let me please turn this over to Frank Wabu and whose name, whose place, native place names in southern New England. Thank you very much, Roxanne and the PHB board, and good morning and welcome to our guests and viewers. Um, it's been a while since I've dealt uh, with place names, so I had to dust off some notes, but I have prepared what I think is a fairly comprehensive but introductory introduction, introductory uh, uh, information on place names in general, and then we will focus on the Southern New England uh, issues of place name recording and understanding. Let me know, first of all, that the entire country was blanketed with a dense uh, pistache of place names. Scholars have noted that in some areas where it has been possible to interview native speakers still living on their Aboriginal lands, extensive lists of these names have been compiled and much have been learned about the system of naming they reflect and the cultural knowledge they incorporate. This is an important point. Where place names can be accurately analyzed within the language of origin, they shed light on the history, cultural attitudes, and values of the people that use them. Names of particular topographical features frequently survive their source language by centuries. <clears throat> Political movements support place name studies because they impact something that's practical and on the minds of Native Americans, land claims. They want their lands back. Place names as a way of documenting the existence of such people. In general, place names reflect to a very important extent a detailed encyclopedic knowledge of the environment, and they have much to tell us about <clears throat> how natives perceived their environment, communicated about it, and made use of their environment, how they organized perceptions of their territory and space in general. They named prominent landmarks and places that were important for the plants, animals, and other resources found there. Other names indicate sites of recurring activities or singular events or supernatural figures. One important thing that I discovered in studying place names from uh, 20th century uh, historical uh, scholarly studies is that there is an opportunity to find natives who still speak their language, their language was not destroyed, their culture was not destroyed, who still live on the ancestral lands, and they can tell us a great deal about certain uh, place names that are uh, particularly for ritual and subsistence activities. I want to give you one example from Alaska and compare it to Southern New England. <clears throat> There's a creek in Alaska, a six mile stretch, which uh, confluence with a river. And in this area, um, natives have been able to document 18 place names which in addition to cemetery and settlement sites, place names here derived from fishing, foraging, trapping, food preparation activities, and the objects associated with them, including boats, fences, smokehouses, and so on. Let me read you some of the place names that are on this map. I'm not gonna say the names because I don't know the languages. Place name number one indicates where fish is harvested, where a fish fence was put across, shabby smokehouse, where coffins fall down, a cemetery site. Fish traps float upon it. Where grass is gathered, where celery is gathered, bushing place on a fish spreader, 18 place names. By contrast, in Southern New England, if you look at a place name in Rhode Island, let's say Meskwamaket, which literally means where we catch the red fish or the salmon, that is a single dot on a map. You don't get this dense patterning of clustering that reveals how people use the particular area because the natives have been gone for a very, very long period of time. <clears throat> the distribution of place names, the analysis and their meanings in places can contribute to recovery of information on foraging, fishing, and hunting strategies and long-term land use. 
Historical tales, myths, and vocations are important in many societies for teaching about the relationship of ancestors to the land, and people often specialized, who have specialized ritual knowledge, share this information. Now let me share with you a different place and make an important point about Native American spirituality. I'm looking at another place name in Idaho among the Nez Perce people. <clears throat> this is a topographical feature known to the Nez Perce people as monster's heart. According to the legend, monster swallows up many animal beings and coyote defeats him in battle cuts his body up and throws the parts in different directions, liberating the captives. In the Nez Perce tradition, the blood of this monster became the Nez Perce people. That has nothing to do with factuality, but I use this place name to indicate that a primary reason for misunderstanding between natives and non-natives over the centuries has been the fact that natives live in one world non-natives live in an entirely different world and never the twain did meet. In oral cultures, names do not convey facts as this example from the next Pierce illustrate. They are metaphorical. As metaphor, they tell a story. Stories breathe life into names. A name is defined by a story and the meaning behind the name is found in the story and in turn is preserved by the storytellers whose knowledge goes beyond ordinary people. You know, when I started place names, I asked myself, you know, what's, what's the use of studying place names? Is there any higher calling that place names draws us to? And for that, next slide, please. Next slide, please. Um, <clears throat> for that, I turned to a professor I studied under in graduate school. Uh, next slide, please. I want to share with you some of his deeper thoughts on history. I think it's very important for place name motivation. Professor said that history is a means of conserving the values of the past, implicit in the careful and accurate recollection of past events, such as place names, is a conviction about the enduring worth of present events. Historical activity provides values to prize the values of past human events, and thus to rescue them from the night of non-being. Concern for history, place names, is a measure of the meaningfulness of life as seen from the native point of view. Concern for history is a special mark of humanness and the study of history is one of the most essential means of affirming and augmenting the significance of one's personal existence, the tribal peoples whose names they come from. Next slide, please. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. That's Go, go back one. <clears throat> this is a reading and reflection uh, section. Um, when you get the full slide package, you'll get the link to this gentleman's um, essay. What he's doing here is he's doing a poetic essay, mystical essay, on trying to recover the meaning of a single word in the extinct Narragansett language, the word for bear, Bukunawa. And what it illustrates very, very concretely <clears throat> is that understanding place names is, requires an interdisciplinary approach, requires ling linguistics, ecology, historical, white Indian relations, and spirituality. <clears throat> More than scientific linguistics is needed to understand the American Indian past and place names. The implication for place names is that accurate documentation rescues each name from the night of non-being. Next slide, please. <clears throat> now we begin the talk proper, uh, the more technical aspects, the general uh, brief but broad comprehensive overview of what place names is all about. Before we do that, we have to look at, next slide, please, what language is, what linguistics is, and what toponymy place names is. Language is a rule-bound communication system. A technical uh, definition from a dictionary, lexical definition, communication by speeding, writing, speaking, writing, and making signs. I have an entirely different definition of language when seen from the Native American point of view. 
the basic tenet or assumption is that language is the very source of thought. And because of that, I say that language gives the ability of human beings to do anything with impossibility. To say it another way, praying, singing, naming, and speaking are the gifts of the creator. See, from the native point of view, everything comes from the creator. The natural world comes from the creator. One's language comes from the creator. And the place names come from the creator. So everything is a gift. That's hard to understand for non-native peoples. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Language is universal. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Next slide, please. Okay. Linguistics. This is a very important topic that one must master if one's going to do any type of trace, place name translations. Linguistics is defined as the study, scientific study of language consisting of visual form, because we're talking about the written form, which is the morphology, the sound called phonology, meaning, semantics, the rules for putting it all together as seen in vocabulary and grammar in speech. We are doing primarily linguistics, uh, uh, historical linguistics. Next slide, please. <clears throat> grammar is simply the rules for changing the meanings of words. Again, I'm emphasizing the fact that language, knowledge of the language is so important because that's what the colonists did not have. And that's why they could not translate the names or even understand them. Next slide, please. <clears throat> um, I note that the American Indian tribes in Southern New England spoke similar languages and dialects comprising a uniform subset of the Eastern Algonquian language family, which in turn is a subset of a larger family called the Algonquian language family, which consists of about 30 languages throughout the land. And they are descended from a grandfather language called Proto-Algonquian. These oral languages in our region were highly structured, complicated, and only imperfectly really, uh, recorded before they passed into silence. Down at the bottom, I show two references. This is the, the Handbook of North American Indians from the Smithsonian Institution. Is the book you want to go to if you want a, an understandable, scholarly, but comprehensive overview of topics on Indians of, uh, of the Northeast. The one below, you can use that for your family. They got some really good stuff there, pictures and so on. Next slide. This is a snapshot map of the Algonquian, Eastern Algonquian languages in green. In red are the Iroquois. It's interesting. I heard a program, NPR program, many years ago. Two members from the Ojibwe Nation were speaking about their language, and they said that they saw in the Book of Guinness Book of World Records that their language was said to be the most complicated language in the world to learn. That's very interesting. A primitive people who did not have reading and writing, yet scholars spent many, many years trying to figure it out. And they're still trying to figure it out. Next slide, please. Knowledge of Algonquian languages, again, important for place name, translation, recovery, knowledge that the colonists did not have. Next slide, please. I'm not going to spend any time on this other than to say that the languages are very complicated, they're very hard to learn, and they're very hard to teach. Next slide, please. This is a snapshot of one category that scholars study, nouns. There was nine categories listed where you see the yellow highlights, you can ignore them. This is from a book I did on the grammar of the Narragansett language, but it shows the details that must be mastered before one can hope to apply that knowledge to place the translation. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Okay, we've uh, mentioned language, linguistics, now toponymy. toponymy. Toponymy is the scientific study of place names, their origins, meanings, and use. Hundreds of thousands of Indian place names existed in Southern New England, hundreds of thousands, and only a small fraction of them were recorded, and of that small fraction, most of them were erased. And I have empirical evidence for that, which I'll share with you later on. <laughs> place naming is a gesture of thanksgiving for a gift from the creator. The meanings transcend the mere written shadow description. Most of the translations we get in Southern New England are what I call bare bones literal trans translations. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Next slide, please. <clears throat> Why are Indian names important? Uh, we mentioned this before, but it's important to iterate it. When they can be accurately analyzed within the language of origin, they shed great light on the history, cultural attitudes, and the values of people that use them. Where place names can be accurately analyzed is not true in Southern New England. As a result, 
Reliably analyzed place names from the Northeast are relatively rare. Next slide, please. <clears throat> this is a meaningful slide. What place names potentially tell us about native life ways? They reflect an encyclopedic knowledge of the environment. The native peoples have to have an exact and precise knowledge of their environment. Where fish were, where animals were, where we get blueberries, where we get this, where we get that. And they had to know when, when to go. They had a GPS, a perfect GPS in their minds. <clears throat> they also tell us about how people perceive and make use of their environments, important for geographic features such as flora, fauna, areas of cultural and spiritual importance, and an important part of oral tradition, such as storytelling, by which knowledge was passed on from one generation to another. Next slide, please. <clears throat> If you don't have time to finish this talk, I have prepared a 10 year summary, a takeaway summary that I've discovered of place names in Southern New England in general. I claim that these four points are, are correct. First, I, I have found that many so-called Indian names are not even Indian words. Boxit, Swampscott, Horseneck, Mosquito Hawk, they are no way Indian names. Most of the Indian names were not recorded by systematic enumeration, such as is done in the 20th century, but by happenstance. If you look at the front cover of my, well, you can't see it, I guess. Well, I guess you can. This is the book that I did in 2010. It's free online. I'll show you the uh, website later on. I don't know if you can see it, but there's a map here that's a reconstruction of a colonial map. Most of the place names are on the East Coast where colonists lived. They had no interest in places that they were not going to live in or, or use as a land base. Many names are indecipherable, like Escuhi. There's five or six different translations. The smartest linguists in the world cannot make heads or tails out of a word like that. There's just too much missing. I mentioned morphology as the important aspect of linguistics. That's recognizing a word and being able to break it down, like the word geometry, earth measurement, being able to uh, segment the word with the meaningful elements and put it all together. You can't do that with many of these words. And the most tragic thing is that most names were changed. Whether that's true of Massachusetts and other states, I don't know, but I can show you 65% of the names in Rhode Island were completely expunged. They no longer exist in any government databases. For example, where I live now is called the Quidnick Island by everybody on this island, but that's not the official name. The official name is Rhode Island, which was put on the map in about 1644, once the island quote had been sold. <clears throat> what this amounts to in my mind, I call it cultural identity theft. Next slide, please. Let me show you a couple of maps. Next slide, please. This is New England. I'm sure everybody knows who that is. I deal with Rhode Island, Connecticut, and Massachusetts, principally Rhode Island and Massachusetts. Next slide, please. This is the only historic map I'm going to put up. It shows where the name New England comes from. It's 1616 by John Smith. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Uh, I'm going to show you three maps now that are uh, educational in nature. You see these on the internet. They're used in schools quite a bit. They are useful. This is showing the ancient tribal territories, the homelands in southern New England, uh, around 1620, before the troubles began. The green uh, blotch there, so to speak, is the southern New England area. The weedy white line are the tribal territories. The dashed lines are present day state names. So we see that the Narragansett occupied most of Rhode Island. Now these are very useful maps and I encourage them and I, I hope for more uh, such educational uh, uh, materials will come out. But there's an error here where it says Wampanoag. In 1620, those, the people of that region were not known as Wampanoag. The colonists knew them as the Poconokets. Poconokets means people of the first land. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Here's another map. Um, I, I, uh, early tribal names recorded by Europeans around 1620. Again, these are uh, these are single dots on a map. They are important to the people uh, whose ancestors put them on the map. But it's this is good stuff to show people that hey, you know, there are Indians here, there are Indians here, and uh, let's get at least some information about them. Next slide, please. 
This is the territory of the Wampanoag about 1620. If it was 1620, it should say territory of the Poconope. But this is a good map. It shows some of the villages underlined, Wampanoag villages. It also shows two places where names were changed. On the top, it shows Salem uh, replaced Namkiak, which means eel place. And Shaman, that's not the correct. We don't know what that is because it's too much uh, meaning uh, there's not enough information in that word as it's spelled to translate it but that became boston now this map shows a small handful of villages of the wampanoags in one of the books that i wrote that uh roxine uh roxanne i'm sorry mentioned um i take quotes from historical sources and there's one from Mort's relation which records a speech that the massasoit gave and the Massasoit is recorded as having mentioned 30 different villages that belong to the Poconoke nation. Next slide, please. I'm going to show you now a couple of uh, tables of actual place names. I'm going to uh, spend a minute of showing you how one name is actually translated using the linguistics uh, machinery. Most of these place names will consist in using English grammatical terms of a noun, maybe uh, an adjective, maybe uh, a diminutive, a locative, or a pluralization. Uh, most of the names are quite literal in translations. Uh, next slide, please. This is a table from New England. Uh, what I show here is the Algonquian word. Like, look at the word Massachusetts. On, uh, to the right is the translation, and the reference for this is the eminent Dr. James Hammond Trummel in 1881. On page 23, he gives one translation for this word. There's several because nobody knows for sure. How he analyzes this word is as follows. The entire Bible, the entire Christian Bible, New and Old Testament, were translated, was translated into Natick, Massachusetts in 16, I'll give you the date later on. And this book has been studied extensively because it, it provides the vocabulary and grammar one needs to understand the language. Trumbull used the Bible and he looked at the word Massachusetts and realized that the original word was Massachusetts. The last TS should be ignored in this analysis. So he looks at the word and he decides there's four morphemes, four meaningful elements that Massachusetts can be divided up into. The masa comes from M-A-S-S. -S. The wachu on the second line comes from A-C-H-U in Massachusetts. The S in Massachusetts stands for ash, which is a pluralizer. So, so far we have great hills and the E-T is called the locative which is usually a preposition, at, in, on, near, word. So when you put it all together, Masa Wachu Ashit comes from the word Massachusetts by analysis of the Bible linguistically, and the translation at or near the Great Hills is one translation that most people accept. We can go into the others, but there's not enough time. You can look at these at your leisure. I tried to pick ones where the spelling uh, can be looked at and you can, uh, you can more or less figure out what it would have been in the Algonquian languages. Next slide, please. <clears throat> this is a sample of present day Massachusetts state names. The purpose of, primarily of this slide is to show you the different languages in Massachusetts. In parentheses, we have Wampanoag, Narragansett, Natick, Penacook, Pocumtuck, and Nipmuc. Um, Merrimack, uh, there's two translations there from the Penacook. Most people, uh, state that it means swift water place, but most references uh, describe it as deep place or deep, deep river. But most of these are educated guesses. I've scouted most of these are educated guesses. I've scouted as the foremost scholar on the Algonquian languages in the world today. If he says they're educated guesses, I believe him because I have found the same thing in my studies. Next slide, please. <clears throat> I said that one of the most tragic um, facts that I came across was name erasure. Once the colonists became stronger and stronger, more and more land deeds were entered into, more and more names were put on the map, 
And when they took over these lands, they just changed the names. As I told you on Aquidneck, 1644, Aquidneck no longer exists. That name is retired forever. Next slide, please. <clears throat> here's, a, here's an essay from the Smithsonian Institution. Anything from the Smithsonian is probably worth looking at. This gentleman does a broad survey of the renaming process across the entire country for this, from the 17th to the 19th centuries. He notes, for example, that the early Puritans, they largely ignored the Indian names, preferring to put names from Old England, English names, or from the Old Testament, although they did keep some names for topographical features. Um, in late 17th century, when deeds became uh, uh, plentiful and a common occurrence, uh, Indian names were used in land transactions. And there's a lot of place names you find in land transactions. One name might be spelled four or five different ways in different documents. So that makes it difficult. Next slide, please. Here's a commendable effort. I would like to see more of this. A commendable effort of remembering ancient voices. This is an online uh, work by two professors from Northeast University, Northeastern University. Professors Dillon and Connell, they took a directory of Boston place names, and I forgot how many, but they put them on a map, and they have other maps and description. We need much more of this in society. We need this to be done more in schools, newspapers, television programs, signs, monuments, and other markers, and perhaps uh, future PHP talks. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Okay, so returning to a, a general description of place names, because my main focus here is to give you a fairly comprehensive overview of the place name situation in this country. Next slide, please. The Smithsonian Institution, which is the premier institution for scholarly studies of Native Americans, uh, in looking at all the place names that they could find, they decided that four categories was fairly exhaustive for classifying or subsuming most of the place names, all the place names. And the most, um, the most important one is the descriptive. By far the largest category of descriptive names has six subdivisions. The most important are sites named after their physical configuration or appearance, sites named for associated vegetation, Sites named for animals, birds, insects, fish, characterized by permanent or seasonal occurrence. There are members of the species name. Um, place names for colors, sounds, smells, and shapes. The other three categories, um, the bottom one, names referring to history and mythology. I gave an example for the Nez Perce people. Next slide, please. The requirements for any place name study. These, these requirements, spelling, pronunciation, grammar, and speaker, these pertain to, I would say, more 20th century studies. Whereas the example from Alaska with the 18 place names indicates, they went and discovered a fluent, bilingual fluent native speaker in Foreman, who could tell them the correct spelling, the correct pronunciation, and the grammar, and they could segment the word like we did for Massachusetts, Massawachuset, in his or her own language and tell you exactly what it means. In Southern New England, we didn't have that luxury because the colonists had no interest in really understanding a great deal about Native Americans. They came here, as Francis Jennings said, for one reason, to take the land. That's his opinion, I quote it. We're forced to reconstruct it from these poorly documented historical records uh, and documents, and from knowledge of the language, which we have a much, much better idea about now, but we had no such idea. Only missionaries were interested in doing language because their job was to convert the native peoples and they, the native peoples uh, were, uh, had oral languages only. They needed to be taught how to read and write for the purpose of reading the Bible. And that's why they spent so much time on that activity. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so let's formalize uh, some of the reasons why Southern New England names could not be accurately recorded. Obviously, there was a foreign language communication barrier. As far as I know, I've never read that there was a requirement 
uh, for Algonquian as a second language to be taken by colonists who came here. I've never read it. I could be wrong, but I doubt it. James Hammond Trumbull, he says that the average colonist was not a well-educated person. He didn't come from an upper-class family background in England, so he wouldn't get a rich university education in the 1600s. As a result, they're semi-literate. And if you're spoken a word in a foreign language, if you don't study a foreign language, you're not going to understand it. Sometimes the Indians, they asked, uh, you know, for land claims especially, they weren't sure themselves what it was called. I mean, just think about it. One can speak their language fluently, but it doesn't mean that you can analyze it and explain the meanings, the etymologies and so on of words in your language. So as a result, most of the names were misheard, misunderstood, misreported, or were mere guesses with rare exceptions. That's because few have interpretable morphology. The word Massachusetts as interpretable morphology, and one can create, as Trumbull did, a consistent argument to say that it means at or near the Great Hills. You can't do that with most of these words. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Why I study Indian place names. I tell people that Indian place names, by and large, are the last and lasting memory of American Indians. If you speak to a, an average American citizen, uh, about Indians in Southern New England. <clears throat> the only thing that they can associate with Indians is the place names. In some cases, that's all that's left of these languages is these poorly spelled place names that are hard to interpret and hard to understand. Next slide, please. <laughs> okay, where, do these, where does this language knowledge come from? Here I'm talking to people who might be interested in becoming a toponymic analyst. Next slide, please. The most important information comes from the Holy Bible, which was, it's called the Indian Bible, the John Elliott Indian Bible. He was a missionary. His job was to convert people. As I mentioned, his job was to <clears throat> get them to read and write so they could read this masterful book called the Bible. But it is a fundamental source for vocabulary and grammar of the regional languages. <clears throat> In addition to that, it has been a primary source for the, for the only revival of an American Indian language in North America called the Wampanoag language. And that effort was headed by Jesse Little Doe Beard of the Mashpee Wampanoag people. She received a fellowship to MIT. She studied under the top minds in the country. Uh, she received a master's degree from MIT and wrote her thesis on the grammar of her ancestors' language. She also received the MacArthur Fellowship. I've got it, who is the premier and foremost authority on Indian languages, says that the Bible is accurate. Because the Bible is accurate, the Wampanoags were able to derive a dictionary in modern spelling and meaning uh, based on the Bible. Very important source for understanding place names. Next slide, please. <clears throat> John Eliot also wrote a book on grammar, how the language works grammatically. Very important work. Next slide, please. <clears throat> this is a book that many people know, the Roger Williams book, A Key into the Language of America, 16. I have studied this book extensively because I work uh, primarily on uh, efforts to revive the Narragansett language. The Bible has about, uh, the Indian Bible has about, uh, 800,000 words. This book has only 2,100 lines of the Algonquian language. There's not much there. But it's useful for people to, it's probably the best anthropological work that's been done in Southern New England on the Indians. Anything you want to know, he says it there, but you must take it uh, from his point of view. He is a missionary. He wants to convert them to Christianity but it's a primary source for the life ways of the native peoples of this region. Next slide, please. <clears throat> this is the Opus Magnus for the extinct language of Massachusetts for the grammar. There are two volumes. Um, when John Eliot and his uh, assistants uh, set up praying towns for the conversion of Indians, says th this is where they were taught to uh, read and write. And indeed, many of them became very proficient and many native peoples became very proficient. They wrote wills and deeds, and these uh, documents were collected, and they were assembled, and they were presented to the eminent Dr. Ives Goddard, and in the second volume, he did a grammatical sketch. 
the Massachusetts language based on the Bible, based on the writings of native peoples, which shows dialectical differences from other languages of the Algonquian language family. And all of this is put into a very hard to understand, very dense, very technical summary of the Indian languages of this region. Next slide, please. Just to recap, um, let me draw and re uh, recall two discoveries. Um, most of it something happened again. Most of the names are, have either uh, been lost or they were never reported. In Rhode Island, 65% of the names are completely lost. Many names are so badly spelled that they're very hard to understand or they're inde indecipherable completely, especially in Rhode Island and Connecticut. In Rhode Island alone, one half the names are pure noise. You can't make heads or tails out of them. The consequences of conquest and domination it is a loss of cultural identity of native peoples and the erasure of general American history. And most importantly, this is the most important point in my mind. It reinforces the myth that there are no more Indians. You know, when I, I've spoken to people, I've been in the business for 30 years and I've spoken to all different kinds of people. I used to take questions on the internet. People would email me, sometimes they'd call me up. No, there are no more Indians here. They don't look like Indians. They don't look like the Indians I see in the movies. So it's, you know, it's very hard to tell people, to convince people that indeed uh, Native American uh, tell people we are still here and we're not going anywhere. Next slide, please. Okay, we're coming close to the end now. Let me provide you some older and newer uh, Indian place name reference books. Next slide, please. And indeed, Frank, you have about 10 minutes more. Thank you. This is by far the most important book by Trumbull, Indian Place Names of Connecticut and Interpretation of Rhode Island and Massachusetts. Next slide, please. If you've never looked at Place Names, well, this is the most comprehensive and popular reference. It covers all of New England. Hundreds of thousands of names existed, but he found about 4,800. Uh, next slide, please. This is by far the most um, current and authoritative work on place names by the late Professor William Bright, Native American place names for the United States. Not much for New England though, because it's just not there. Next slide, please. This is the book that I did. Go to the next slide, please. This is a finding that I want to emphasize. Um, it's the yellow highlight, it's not there, but I went to the government and I said, how many place names are there? I downloaded their database. I looked through it all. I found under 200 names. When I did my uh, historic uh, search, I found over 500 names. That means that 65% no longer exist. Of the ones that I found in history, 65% are completely erased. Uh, next slide, please. This is where you go if you want to change a place name. Next slide, please. I guess this, uh, I'll spend a minute on this. Let me try to explain how a name was misheard. Second from the bottom is boxit. That's the modern corrupted spelling. <clears throat> it comes from the word which looks to be like we qua boxit. But John Eliot taught us that the W sound is, is silent. It's almost a whistling sound. So if I'm going to go back in history and I pretend I'm a native person speaking this word to someone, it probably sounded like boxit. All you hear is the boxit, and that sounds like boxit. And that happens uh, quite a bit in place. Next slide, please. 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 This is the method that I use to analyze place names. It's an input process method. The input is the word as it's spelled today from the Narragansett language in Southern New England or Quidnick. I go to the Bible. Uh, I've got to do this in my in my book, which is online for free. He finds that the elements mean island and uh, on some kind of island is the translation. The input matches the output, so that is what I call a high signal. That's a very rare phenomenon. We don't have time to go through the rest of them. See, next slide, please. This is an example where it's completely off the uh, beaten track. Swampscott is the input, but as I analyzed it, Squawkskit is probably how the native people. Next slide, please. 
Oh, we lost that one. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide, please. This is my website, Frank O'Brien Wobble. It's a link. If you get the hard copies, you can click on this link. And I have uh, many, many documents that are free to the public. Names uh, on the Narragansett language. I have uh, the cultural history book that Roxanne mentioned uh, by another title. It's free online. My, my place names book, Understanding Indian Place Names, is free the manuscript that that this result this book resulted from is free online if you go to that you'll find many many books i gave all my stuff away for free there's maps lots of other stuff next slide please i always end my talks with this blessing may peace be in your hearts there has not been much peace with indians for the last four or five hundred years next slide please this is me next slide please and we are now at the end I, I say tabatni, uh, which means thank you. Wanayish means let your journey be good. Thank you for listening. I hope the uh, talk has been informative. I hope you got something out of it. Thank you very much again. Thank you very much, Frank. That's, that's uh, really appreciated. And as we've all realized, there's an incredible amount of information, incredible amount of thought, incredible amount of thinking that we all need to do. And Frank has merely skimmed the surface. Um, and there's much more even in his, his uh, presentation. And the full slide sort of set that he did, I think was Frank about 140, 50 slides or so. Yes. Let's see if we can manage to put a PDF up on, um, on the Partnership of Historic Boston's. It's a very, very lengthy one. I don't think actually that we can email it because it's it's so big even as a PDF form, but we'll see how we can get this out to folks. Uh, I want to study this a lot more too. But first what I and we all want to do is hear some more, an additional perspective from Rashad Young, who, as I said earlier, is a member of the Mashantucket Pequot Tribal Nation. Uh, he is also Narragansett, Pocanocket, and Namaskat of descent. He works for the Mashantucket Cultural Resources Department, researching and revivifying, restoring to life uh, the Pequot language, including teaching it to children. He's a craftsman too, enjoys, among other things, making bows, and is a traditional flute maker. Actually, one of the things I was wondering, Rashad, is have you made your own flutes, it sounds like. Background in computer sciences uh, and used to play um, uh, Division I football for his college. So, Rashad, can you please give your thoughts, your response, your ideas from your perspective as a s member of a Southern New England native tribal nation uh, to Frank's talk and this topic in general of place names, whose name, whose power. Absolutely. Um, first, I want to say thank you, Roxanne, Frank, and um, PHB um, for allowing me to be on here and give my perspective. Um, and before I start, I want to say, Wiyikisuk, Natasawish Rashad, Napionwachi, Mashantakwa, and Pikwatu Kwa Nayakansu. So, um, good day. My name is Rashad. Um, I'm from Mashantucket. Um, I'm Pequot and Narragansett. I'm also a uh, Namaskit and Poconoket. Um, and uh, so to begin, I, I wanted to, I want to get into a few things. Um, I know I don't, I don't have quite as much time as Frank, but I'm going to try to um, squeeze in as much as I can in here. Uh, so, First, I want to talk a little bit about language itself, uh, specifically the English language. Um, so during the time of contact, English, believe it or not, was not actually standardized um, for writing, um, speaking. So you can go through English documents, and there are a few that I've been through from the 1640s where somebody in Groton, Connecticut, is talking about he's collecting Indian corn and he does this for three days in a row and every day he spells Indian and corn different ways so he'll, <laughs> he'll spell corn c-o-r-n the next day he'll spell it c-o-r-e-n 
and the next day he'll spell it C-O-R-N-E. And Indian is spelled multiple different ways, I-N-D-I-A-N, I-N-D-O-A-N, and I-N-D-E-O-A-N. Um, so this just goes into that English itself was, was really not standardized at this time. Many official documents in England were actually written in Latin at this time. So it wasn't until the 18, the late 18th century and the early 19th century that English was actually standardized. So this could also affect how our place names were written down. Because if English, if they were writing English, you know, multiple different ways, our place names could be written multiple different ways as well. And that's reflected in um, our place names. So another thing that um, Dr. O'Brien touched on was the dropping of the first syllable of a lot of place names, um, particularly W's, M's. Um, and that actually comes from the cadence of our language. So the general rule um, of what I've learned of our language was that people like Roger Williams, um, James Trumbull, and Elliot said that our language was like a babbling brook, or it was like a song, like singing. So they noted that the cadence was kind of up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down. So many times the first syllable of a word is a low stress, and the second syllable is high in cadence. Right. So when when somebody uh, <laughs> colonist was hearing it, um, a lot of times they didn't hear the first part of the word, or they ignored it because it wasn't um, emphasized. So I just wanted to put that out there. And that, unfortunately, as Frank said, makes some of the place names hard to decipher because we don't know what sometimes the first syllable was of the words. Um, but I, I wanted to go through a few place names in my area, um, Mashantucket. So Mashantucket itself is actually from Mashantuquak and before I actually get into that, I want to say that there is a distinction between the East and the West in Southern New England. So the Eastern languages actually have ut or et, and they denote a place on the end of the words like Massachusetts, Narragansett. Um, and then the West has uk, which is um, pretty much a similar sound, but that denotes the place of somewhere here. Now, most of the place names in Connecticut now have the ut or et uh, locative on the end. And that's because of a lot of the Connecticut tribes being displaced very early, especially the Pequot, my tribe, um, and some of the Nipmuc were, were pushed away into more um, ET speaking, speaking places. So Mashantucket, as we know it today, and Connecticut, as we know it today, would have been Kwanitakak and Mashantakwak with, with a K on the end. So that's just one of the dialectal things that is different. But Mashantucket comes from um, Mushi or Masai, which is big uh, or great, and um, uh, Tuk, which is from tree. Matak is a tree. So it's either the great tree place or, or, me, or many tree place. So uh, like a much wooded land, which is what our uh, current uh, meaning is of that. Um, I also wanted to, to make a note on a few dialectal things. So a lot of people here probably know Narragansett, and we say Narragansett every day. Um, but that is not actually what my ancestors would have called themselves or the place where they were at. So there were four distinct dialects in Southern New England Algonquin. And Southern New England Algonquin is actually, um, by a few scholars, Ives Goddard and David Costa, believed to be uh, a subgrouping of Eastern Algonquin. And Eastern Algonquin is actually a subgrouping of the overarching Algonquin language itself. And Eastern Algonquin is actually the only genetic subgroup. It has a lot of innovations that other Algonquin languages don't have. And SNEA, Southern New England Algonquin, actually has some innovations from the Eastern Algonquin that other Eastern Algonquin languages don't have. Uh, and that can be um, 
attributed to the fact that uh, prior to colonization, the Haudenosaunee people or the Iroquois, um, the Six Nations as they're known now, were actually cutting off New England and the North and the South from other Algonquin speaking peoples. And it was noted that just, it was just before colonization that the Haudenosaunee were kind of pushed back into their New York area, Great Lakes um, region now, and that they were, had a much bigger sphere of influence. So that cut off New England from other Algonquin languages and our language in Southern New England actually evolved um, on its own independently. <clears throat> so let's get here. Um, there are a few, uh, one things I wanted to touch on before I get into the my final place name um, thing was that there are many loan words from Southern New England, Algonquin that are in the English language that a lot of people really don't know. Um, one of them is powwow. So the word powwow, which is known as an Indian gathering now, um, where there's a celebration is actually from the word uh, powwow, which was a medicine man, or in the old literature was called a sorcerer. Um, so English heard about the powwow. And whenever there was something going on a healing ceremony, many people would gather at it. Um, so they thought that it was a gathering, and not the actual medicine man himself. Um, skunk is a word from um, Southern New England Algonquin from Sakonk, which um, is the same animal. A pumpkin is from pumpkin, and it means round. It means it's a round um, plant. Um, wampum, um, as, as many of you know, wampum was actually the official currency of New England and um, New Netherlands very early in the 1600s. Uh, moose, moose is actually a um, Algonquin word, and it means to smooth from their habit of scraping trees with their antlers. <clears throat> squash, so squash is an interesting one. Um, squash actually is a good example of how the words can lose their meaning. So this could have happened to place names as well. So squash doesn't really mean anything in our language. And that's because a squash itself was actually called askutask. And the plural ending for, for that um, an inanimate object is A-S-H, so ash. So it would have been squashes, plural, would have been askutasquash. So instead of saying the entire word, they just kind of took the back end of it and that became the English word for this crop that was here. So askutas is the real word for squash and askutasquash is plural for squashes. Um, another one which is interesting to me is the word for cat. So our word for cat is pasu and the word for a small cat, which were introduced was Pasuis. So if you look online, um, there's a debated um, etymology of the word uh, pussy for pussy cat, um, which was the historic word for a small calf. And our language it actually is almost identical. Pasuis was the word for a kitten or a small cat. Um, and so just to get into some of these place names, um, and I'll finish up with this. Um, as Frank said, a lot of the place names have been lost. You know, there were, I, I, I'm sorry, Frank, I'm forgetting the exact number. It was 100, how many out of 500 that are, were lost? Yeah, the 180, uh, 354 were lost. Yep. Okay. Um, and I'm sure there, there are even more that are lost. Absolutely. Like, and if you come to some of our, our communities, we actually have some of the old names. So for example, um, there uh, behind Foxwoods Casino is actually the Great Swamp is our Great Swamp area. Mm -hmm. So that today is called the Great Swamp, but historically it actually had two different names. And one was Ohumasaki, which means um, owl shelter or owl land because uh, it must have been abundant with owls at some point. And another one was uh, Kapakamak. And Kamak 
is a word that is used for shelters. And the beginning part of it is actually um, the kappa is from a word for thicket. So it was a shelter full of thicket. So um, these names are not used anywhere besides my community. Um, and many people don't know them at all. So I'm sure that there were multiple more um, place names like this. Uh, another one that I wanted to touch on that Frank brought up in his PowerPoint was Misquamica. Uh, Misquamica is actually, um, was actually all the way from where the beach is now, if you know where Misquamica Beach is, it was all the way to the Pawkatuck River. And the Pawkatuck River, the Rhode Island side of it, was called uh, Mishquamaka or Mush Mushquanamaka. And that was because the salmon used to go all the way up the Pawkatuck River. And the Pawkatuck River was the place where the salmon were, were fished and caught. In modern times, it's been moved to the beach. So now it doesn't really have a meaning because, you know, the salmon aren't swimming onto the shore there. They're going up the river into the Pawkatuck. Mm -hmm. um, there's a place name in Rhode Island, which I uh, actually like a lot, and it's uh, Kawisa. Kawisa, and many people say Kawisit or, or uh, Kawisit, but it's Kuwisit, and it's from the word uh, for pine. So the word for pine is Kuwa, and to de denote a diminutive, something small, like a small cat, Pasuis, you add is on the end. So Kawisa is Kuwa and east. So it's a small pine barren, basically, small pine land, because it used to be a, a, a pine barren. <clears throat> um, and to end, one of my favorite uh, place names is actually up um, in Massachusetts on the Connecticut River in Massachusetts. And it's in Nipmuc and um, I believe it's near, near Nipmuc uh, territory up there. Um, near Turner's Falls, if anyone knows where Turner's Falls is in Massachusetts, the waterfall there on the Connecticut um, was actually called uh, Peskyomska. And that's because it was, there was actually a, a large rock in the middle of the waterfall that in modern times has been blasted to create a dam there. Um, and I guess the water rushing onto the rock used to sound like thunder. So Omsk in words denotes a rock and Pesk notes thunder. So mm -hmm. it's thunder rock place. Um, so Pesky Omsk was thunder rock place. So a lot of these, a lot of these place names, um, as Frank said, um, denote natural features in the area, significant things to my ancestors. And um, so, yeah, um, I was happy to give my perspective on these things. Um, if there's any questions after this for me or Frank, um, I'd be happy to answer. Thank you. Thank well. you very, very much, both of you. How about a large round of visual applause or emojis? <laughs> uh, very much thank you for thank you. really got me thinking and um, look, wanting to go and look around the, uh, the landscape more and more and more. We already have a nice lineup of questions in the chat and I encourage others to put questions in the chat. We'll see how many we can get to in the next about 20-25 minutes or so. And also if you want to ask a question sort of live verbally, you can put a, you can go down to the uh, hmm. uh, reactions and there's a little raise hand one. But first let me start with Dave Weed who's uh, been doing things with the partnership for a fair while now. Dave was asking the very first question to Frank, when and why the name Wampanoag begin to be used and the historical name of Pocanocket essentially drop away? When and why? I would have to look that up. I knew it at one time. It's been 10, ten years I'm 75, my mind fails, so I'd have to look it up. <laughs> but it did come into, uh, but as I say, the original name was Poconoke. And I forgot the details of when, how, and why it was changed. But there is a Poconoke tribe today, and there's a Wampanoag nation today. But these names are still in current use. Yeah, they're in current use. 
at the risk of opening up a deeply fraught political question. Is it possible to briefly answer a question that uh, Natalie asked later on uh, on this? Are the Wampanoag and the Pocanoket two different tribes, or did one morph into another? I know today they are two different entities. I, 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 can, I can add a little bit to that, Roxanne, okay. um, from what I know. Um, because I am Poconoket myself, um, I can say that obviously at a certain point, Poconoket was were the only things mentioned in uh, historical writings up until the King Philip's War, when King Philip actually combined, he got a combined force of natives from his surrounding area. And when they got together, they were called the Wampanoag, because they were the Easterners. And Wampai, Wampai means light, or Wampai is east. So Wampanoag is the people of the east. And that was an amalgamation of multiple tribes in the southern New England area, eastern southern New England area. And they were known as that um, until after the war. And many people, um, after the war, you weren't allowed to say you were Poconoket. Um, similarly, in the Pequot War in 1637, after that, you weren't allowed to say you were Pequot. If you were a boy of 14 years or older and you said you were Pequot or Poconoka, you could be killed on site. Um, so a lot of us use different names such as Narragansett or I'm, I'm sure Wampanoag was one of the ways that they did that. But also in the early 1900s, there was an effort to um, strengthen the relationship between sister tribes in the Southern New England area, um, Eastern Southern New England. And Wampanoag was suggested to be used as a name to strengthen um, the ties between these people. But it was, I would say, maybe at the expense of some of the earlier distinctions between people. So, um, you know, there, there are good and bad things to everything, but that's just a general, from my knowledge, that's generally what I believe happened. Thank you very much. That I've been wondering that myself. And the points that you raise, uh, both of you raise, I think uh, underlie another important point that I want to make, which is that Native peoples, Native cultures are not static. It is not this is who they this is who a group was 400 years ago and have never changed but the language the places the peoples and their way of referring to themselves continually morph and change with time because they are living peoples and living languages um and i i was just realizing that wampanoag uh refers it's it's yeah it is because it's living real people um Question from Sarah Stewart of the partnership. Um, she mentions that in places such as Hawaii, native place names are a constant reminder that the land is Hawaiian. And she's wondering today, how can we in New England start to create that kind of understanding, um, given especially the limited number of indigenous place names that are still that still exist or that still are recognized in the landscape. Both of you, Frank, Rochelle. I think one thing you can do is to, for example, I mentioned Rhode Island. <clears throat> There's only 187 that's in government databases, but most people don't look at a government database. All 500 are in in my own book as well as other resources that I use to do my book. So those names are there. Um, like the word Aquidneck is not the official word, but everybody, no one on this island says, I live on Rhode Island, in Rhode Island. That makes no sense at all. But the name of the island is Rhode Island. Everyone calls it Aquidneck. So that kind of education can be done. Pull out, I would look, I'd love to have the old technology I had. I would love to publish those 350 names that were erased. So oh, I don't have that, but that that can be done. You can get any hundreds of thousands of names existed, but a small fraction <laughs> reported, and you can find those names in sources, uh, even though they may be placed in the government databases. Yes, thank you very much, Rashad. Do you have some thoughts too? Yeah, um, I would say 
that you know many people in New England use these place names daily and some of them maybe not be aware that there are still native people in this area um, thanks to Hollywood and and mass media unfortunately the image of a Native American has been skewed towards a certain demographic in our country and I would encourage people to um, research about the people here in this area there's actually a really good um, it's actually a, a primary source it's a painting of um, what's supposed to be Ninigret the second um, and it's actually at the Rhode Island School of Design and it, it's online you can see firsthand what a native of this area looked like and and potentially it could give you an, an idea of what native why native peoples in Narragansett or or Mashantucket or or Poconoke or or um, Mashpee look the way they do um, because we have a primary source of what somebody who was a, a sachem at the time looked like and just like many um, scholars have said it was very difficult for them to tell the difference between the natives of different tribes they had to ask somebody because their features were very similar so i would suggest looking at something like that and then um, maybe you will start to recognize that there are native people around you and oh, maybe, in maybe. classical times in uh the book of a uh, collection of uh, historical quotes from the colonial era uh, somewhere up in Canada, it was noted that an Indian could tell the difference between a Frenchman and a Spaniard by the smell of his hand. <laughs> yes, very much so. So Dave Weed uh, has another question wondering, um, did tribes, when they were actively speaking their languages and multiple languages in the area, um, did they call themselves by a tribal name? or just refer to themselves by the place where they lived. Any idea on that? Tall Oak, Tall Oak had something to say about this. The, uh, the revered elder, the late elder. He said that uh, in all, 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 all over the area, people didn't call themselves, I am Narragansett, I am Poconoke. They might say that, but the name they would use over and over again was Nininawak, which means literally we are all alike. We are the people. We are the human beings. It's translated in many, many ways. Nininawak. Roger Williams has that in his book. That's what Tolo told me, taught me, and I believe when Tolo taught me something. That's that, Thank you very much. That's something I've been wondering, too, very much. Um, I'm looking through more questions. Um, are there... Um, museums here in the southern or New England area uh, that focus on the language history of natives here in uh, the land of the Nininuak. Um, and is there any museums that focus on native art also? I know the Tomacaw Museum in Rhode Island that Lawrence Spears is the executive director of they're actively doing uh, language reclamation for the Narragansett language. And they have classes there. Um, they put out information. They would be a good place. Now, the other tribes, I honestly do not know. Because I don't interfere. I would, with what I they would do. say um, I'm not sure of somewhere that, that focuses on the history of the language. Um, many, many tribes are in language reclamation in a language reclamation period now. So uh, there's a lot of, while there are a lot of words that were recorded enough for people to be able to speak again, just getting, you know, things standardized and, and being able to teach people the language again is an ongoing process right now. And I, I don't believe that there are any museums that have language specific um, areas in them as far as art, I would say uh, Tomaquag, um, Mashantucket Pequot Museum, um, they have, you know, they have ongoing exhibitions uh, with art, different things like that. So those are the two that I would know. And and I, I did want to touch on the, the previous question 
um, about what our people called ourselves because I, I think I lost my train of thought when I was explaining um, Narragansett earlier um, in the dialects, but the Narragansett wouldn't have called themselves that because in southeastern um, Rhode Island, in the southern Rhode Island, they spoke an N or a Y dialect. So what that means is there are certain words where the a few consonants change based on the dialect. Now, our languages in Southern New England are almost identical, barring a few dialectal changes. So they would have been able to been um, understood by everyone, but the dialect would have been slightly different. And I, I equate it to a Boston accent and a New York accent. You know, you can understand somebody from there, but obviously they have a different accent than you. So Narragansett was an R dialect. And that's why there's R's. There's actually no R's in the Narragansett language. Um, but in Western Southern New England, near the Quinnipiac or Quiripi, as they were known as, they use R dialect. So people don't know that our communities were very mixed. So when Roger Williams and other people were speaking to Narragansett, they could have been speaking to someone whose mother might have been from Quinnipiac and they spoke an R dialect. So the kids spoke an R dialect in Narragansett or vice versa. Somebody could have been in Mashantucket and their, um, one of their relatives could have been from Nipmuc and Nipmuc speaks an L dialect. So the child could speak an L dialect, but um, so Mashantucket is a Y dialect area. Narragansett and some Wampanoag is N dialect. R dialect is Quinnipiac, um, Uncachog and in um, Central Mass, Northern Connecticut is Nipmuc. They spoke an L dialect. So Narragansett is really an R dialect version of the word Nanakansuk. So it would be Nanakansuk. And that's why if you speak to Narragansett people, they say Nanakanyuk. I'm, I'm Narragansett. And in Pequot and Niantic, which is close to Narragansett, they're known as the Southern Narragansett, and they're also very close to Pequot. Niantic is actually the same word um, in Narragansett, which means a point. So um, it would be Nayak. So they were the Nayaka, um, but, um, or Nayantuk, Nayantuk. Um, so Narragansett would be in a Y dialect, if I was going to say it, it would be Nayah, Nayakansa, or Nanakansa, or Narakansa. So those small dialectal changes are something that were noted by early scholars, but distinguishing them was hard and they used maybe the first one they heard. So down Narragansett is known as an R dialect when it wasn't in our dialect place. So I just wanted to... Fascinating. That's really interesting yeah. stuff. And I really like your your analogy to some in English dialects, you know, dropping your eyes. Um, right. One's ear just gets you automatically sort of say, oh, I know what they're saying. I yep. may say it differently. You, you, you're not even aware that you're sort of slightly interpreting uh, right. what's going on because it's just totally normal. Um, Brian Woodson was wondering a little bit more about Wampanoag um, and wondering who made the choice for the words so beyond um, the original sort of naming of, of it by the people. More contemporary, uh, was it the First Peoples, Native Peoples, um, when Wampanoag became... Uh, after a lot of effort, um, a federally recognized nation, tribe, did they make the choice to call themselves Wampanoag or was it the uh, government? Or even in the past, was it the existing Massachusetts government starting to shift the name? Anybody know? Do either of you know? I'm not actually sure about that. I know the early colonists, they wrote down uh, Wampanoags. Wampanoags for people on the on, on the coast but i don't i don't know the specific answer to that i that's a, a look up question a research question what's <clears throat> great about this is that in any good excellent talk set of talks we're ending with more questions than we started with because you have been opening our minds and deepening our understandings i'd like to end the uh oh and dave we just put um some excellent uh, reference up there. Um, briefly, can we ask you, Frank and Rashad, how do you feel about the current 
uh, land acknowledgement practice often given at large events. Um, what are your opinions on land acknowledgements and how uh, they're phrased? Are they appropriate? Welcome? And then we'll end. I don't wish to speak about, uh, there's an unwritten law that one tribe does not speak about another tribe out of respect. So I don't have an opinion or comment on it. Thank you, Frank, for sharing it that way. Mm -hmm. Rashad? I would say speaking on the, the side of the people who are giving the acknowledgements, not, not specifically where they're being done. Um, I think that it's, it's definitely a step in the right direction from the past, um, but I think more probably needs to be done still going forward. I can't say exactly what that is right now, but but I think more than just saying, okay, this is the land of these people, you know, um, I, I think more can be done, basically. And would you agree that a land acknowledgement that says this was the land of X group implying that they don't exist anymore, it is not their land anymore, is not the way to start a land acknowledgement? Definitely incorrect. Yeah. Especially if there are people from that area in attendance. Yeah. Well, how, <clears throat> how they got the land is the crux. I think <clears throat> the way somebody best said it is, they stole the land fair and square. Meaning that they had the land deeds, native peoples did not know what the language was. Do you think that here on Aquinnick Island, if there was a fluent bilingual speaker and told Canonicus, my antinomy, listen, brothers, when you put your mark on this paper, Aquinnick Island don't exist no more. It's dead to you. You can never come back here. And if you come back here, we'll have you arrested. Do you think they would have agreed to all of that? They didn't know what was going on. The land was stolen fair and square, according to the English point of view. That is a really, really good way to end this yeah. talk, this conversation, because it says there must be more conversation. Mm -hmm. And so let me let all of us thank you, Frank, and you, Rashad, for really stimulating thoughts, conversation, and filling some knowledge gaps and making us realize there's a lot more we want and to thank you roxanne thank you thank you roxanne thank you gina thank you the whole gina. <clears throat> thank you yes. and what frank ended on really opens up gina if you can show on screen what the next partnership talk will be on october 8th again a saturday morning we will have dr jeremy bangs speaking on Dispossession, Indigenous Land Loss in Plymouth Colony. Dr. Bangs, who lives in the Netherlands, the Netherlands, um, very much is a specialist who has been working deeply and closely with Native groups uh, here in southern New England about, an, uh, w about those deeds and examining those land deeds. So what Frank ended on is... Uh, is what we will be beginning on at our next, sorry, I'm having a little bit of trouble here with my screen, with, in our next um, talk. And also, I would like to mention our next uh, field trip, which is this coming Saturday, the 1st of October. I've just put the link in the, uh, in the chat. If you are in the southern, central, or western New England area, the Partnership of Historic Boston will be taking a trip to Deerfield, Massachusetts uh, to give an English language name. And in Deerfield, we will be visiting Memorial Hall uh, as a field trip to really look at the many different ways that a museum and people can look at this you know, the same event, multiple perspectives on the events of history. If you are at all able, we would welcome you, the partnership would welcome your presence on our field trip on October 1st. 
And with that, I want to thank everyone for coming here. I want to thank the partnership, the board members, John Morrison, who I can see here. He is the president of uh, Partnership of Historic Boston, Sarah Stewart, who's done so much to shepherd us like a collie dog, shepherd us and get us organized to do our fall series. We look forward to speaking with and talking with you all again. Thank you very, very much. This will be, uh, this has been recorded. We will send you the recording. We will try to get you Frank's full presentation if we can get that into sort of a, a, a small enough format that it goes through email. Um, we will also be sending you a survey. We welcome your thoughts and ideas on these present, this presentation, on future presentations. And I want to just say, Thank you very, very much, Frank, Rashad, everyone. Have a good day. Have Bye. a lovely day. Bye-bye there, folks.